Hi there. How's everybody doing? It's great to see you. Hey, I have very, uh, good news in my own life personally. Uh, my wife and I next Friday celebrating 16 years of holy matrimony. We're very excited about that. And uh, we both decided to go for 17. So we're just keeping going. And, uh, you know, every time, uh, you probably have the same thing too if you're married, is that every time that uh, another anniversary comes up or something, uh, you, uh, inevitably the conversation goes back to how you first met. And uh, for my wife and I, we dated for four and a half years before we got married. So we met over 20 years ago. And it was really the greatest night of her life, uh, the day that we met. And uh, we actually met at a mutual friend's house. And uh, this guy that we knew was throwing a party. So we went to his house. And uh, neither of us had ever been to this guy's house before. Neither of us have ever gone back to this guy's house before, which really makes you question how good of friends were we with this person. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we went there. It was December 5th of 1992. And uh, I walked in, and I was in a band years ago. And um, so I walked in, and some people recognized me from the band that I was in. And um, they, I started talking to them, and, and the guy who had hosted the party had just bought this gold top uh, Les Paul, uh, Gibson Les Paul, which as you know, if you play guitar, that only a Gibson is good enough. So anyway, so he had just bought this gold top, Gibson Les Paul, and they're like, hey, Bob, you play it. Tell me what you think. So I put the guitar on. I start playing. And uh, if, you, if you hear my wife tell the story, when she tells the story, a crowd begins to form as I, uh, it could have been like four people, but anyway, uh, a crowd begins to form as I'm playing guitar. And as I'm playing, um, and, and, and I, I mean, I was playing it was pretty good. And, and uh, and so, but as across the room, I see this stunningly beautiful, yet completely uninterested girl uh, across the room. So I put the guitar down. I walk over to her and introduce myself. Now, what I didn't know is that she already knew who I was. She had, come to, she had gone to see my band a bunch of times. And, um, but she didn't want to let on that she knew who I was because she thought that I was like a stuck-up, arrogant musician, which is probably only partially true. And... Um, and so, so I sit down, and I introduce myself. Hi, my name is Bob. Hi, my name is Carrie. And uh, so we sit down, and she tells me about how she just finished her first semester of college. She's uh, going to FAU on a scholarship and, um, and tells me, you know, so I'm asking her, you know, how do you like going to college? Oh, I love college. I remember you like, oh, I love school. And then she says, um, how about you? I'm like, well, I just recently finished um, uh, my high school education. And, uh, and, and so... She says, well, do you, and I'm, you know, and I'm planning on going to co starting college within the next 12 to 18 months. And, um, and she's like, well, do you like school? Now, let me sidebar for a moment. Some of you know this story. Some of you don't. But I, um, <laughs> it took me five years to graduate high school. And uh, so, uh, and I went to, not only did it take me five years to graduate high school, but it took me five years, and I went to summer school every summer. So my mom would say to me, you hate school, but you go to school more than anyone I know. And uh, so she says to me, do you like school? And I, of course, being the honest person that I am, I say, I love school. And uh, I love school too. And uh, my wife always gives me a hard time because she says, you know, we began our relationship with you lying to me. And I tell her, now here's what happens. Years later, I give my life to Jesus and um, I, I, finish, I go to Bible college and graduate with almost a 4.0 GPA, and, which, by the way, wouldn't have been weird if I was a pastor and graduate. Like, yeah, I'd like a C- minus in Bible. Anyway, but I, uh, so I, I, yeah, I did really well in Bible college, and then I went to, uh, and, and then I ended up running a college. So I say, honey, don't think of it as a lie. Think of it as a prophecy. And uh, so that's what I, I, was, I, was, I was prophesying. And uh, so... So then we go on our, a couple weeks later, we go on our first date, and uh, I was, you know, I, I drove this 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit that uh, ran on diesel gas, and uh, diesel was very rare in those days. Uh, and, but anyway, I showed up at her house, knocked on the door, and I had bought, because, you know, I'm not, back then I was not the fashionista that I am today, uh, but back then... Back then, uh, I showed up on our first date. I had bought these pajama uh, pants, and I cut them into shorts because I'm classy like that. And uh, so I cut them into shorts, and then there was this TV show that I liked as a kid, and I went to a comic book shop, and I found a T-shirt of this Japanese animated show called Star Blazers. And so it was, a, it was a black shirt with big orange letters that said Star Blazers. And then um, I had this baseball cap on backwards because I had a, I had a mohawk, 
but I was growing it out, so I was like a chia pet gone bad. And uh, so imagine all of that, and I knock on the door, I'm here to pick up your daughter. And uh, it's like, no, you aren't. And uh, anyway, so we, we, went, we, went, uh, we, we went out on our date, and it's been 20 years now, three kids later. We've never been happier. And, uh, and, and here's the thing, is that when we talk about marriage, and it's, oh, it's great, and it's, it's, you know, it's a lot easier said than done. You know that. Um, and in fact, most couples struggle. All couples struggle to a degree. But you know this. You know the stats that half of couples in America don't make it. And we all start out with the best of intentions, but many times um, we fizzle out. And one of the reasons that relationships fizzle out is because we have this tendency to focus on the start, but not spend any time thinking about how we're going to finish in our marriage. And, um, and, and here's the thing, and, and you know this, because starting in your marriage is easy, right? Going to your own bridal shower, that's a nice day. Like going to your own wedding ceremony, going to your reception, where all of your friends are buying you gifts. Like, I'll do that every weekend, you know? And, uh, but, you know, reality is a bit different, right? So ladies, enjoy your bridal shower now, because once you're married and have kids, you will struggle to find 15 minutes to take a shower, okay? <laughs> That's just how it is. And guys, they want to, you know, you have the bachelor party, and you know, I know the truth is, guys, you're still going to party when you're married. It's just going to be little kid party. This, you know, and it's like, I mean, I go to so many more parties than I did before, but they're all like, you know, Disney parties. And, uh, and for four-year-olds. And, and the thing is, is that starting well is easy. Finishing well, that's really the challenge. And listen, this is the message of God to us. It's the message of God to the people of Israel in Malachi's day. Uh, that there were pe the people of Israel were walking away from their relationships. They were hoping to find fulfillment in some other, uh, you know, relationship with another person. So actually, not only were they walking away from their marriages, they were walking away from their marriages and just going after these foreign women who worshipped other gods. And this was creating all kinds of problems. And, and this becomes now the issue of they had a misunderstanding, and it's the same misunderstanding we have in our culture. They had a misunderstanding of what marriage is. We have a misunderstanding in our culture of what marriage is. And, uh, and so, and this is a, you know, you know this, a big hot topic in our culture. What is married? Who can get married? And all that. And, and let me just tell you that I am not here to be the marriage police. Uh, to say, you know, whatever. But I, I will say this. And as I talk to uh, friends of mine, and they want to argue this point <coughs> about marriage and who can get married and all that, this is the question that I ask. And, and if you're someone who engages in debate, I would just um, throw this out for your consideration. This is the thing that I ask people. What is marriage? Like, if we're going to talk about who can get married, who should get married, and whatever, let's answer this question. What is marriage? And, and usually what they'll say is, and this is every conversation I've had, this is what they'll, they'll say. They'll say, well, it's when two people really deeply care about each other, and they want to spend, and they, they've, uh, they're committing themselves to each other, and they want to spend their lives together. And, and I say, okay, what you have perfectly described is what is called a civil union. Uh, that is exactly what it is. Two people committing themselves to each other for as long as they want to be together. That is the definition of a civil union. A marriage is something different. A marriage is not a commitment. A marriage is a covenant. And a covenant is not just a covenant that you make with another person. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a covenant that you make with another person and your God. And so it's, that's why the Bible would say in Ecclesiastes that it's a cord of three strands that's not quickly broken. It's a man, a woman, and their God that make a decision and make a commitment to one another. And see, that's why what's missing in the conversation about marriage is what's missing in, what was missing in the conversation early on. They, well, you know, we just had this agreement and it didn't work out. No, no, no. Marriage is a covenant between you, your spouse, and your God. Marriage was created by God. That's where we got the idea. He's the one who invented it. And, and it's, the reason is because there was a man and he was alone. And God's solution for the man not being alone anymore was creating this woman that he would be with. That's why in Genesis 2.18, I put it in your notes, if you have your notes there, uh, it says, And the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Equally as important in this idea of marriage is that marriage is a picture of our relationship with God. Once again, Ephesians chapter 5 would say, as the scriptures say, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two are united as one, 
This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Because if there's anything that our culture uh, is confused about, it's marriage. And as Christians, we need to be crystal clear as to what, what the Bible says about marriage, what marriage is. Because listen, your understanding of what marriage is will shape your worldview. Your understanding of what marriage is will influence your relationships now and in the future, and it will influence how your, your, your home operates and how you raise your kids. That's why this is such a critical thing. And not only that, in, in Israel's day, it was the, the, the fate of the nation uh, was rested in what people were doing in their marriage. So I'm going to ask you to open, if you would, to the uh, book of Malachi, chapter 2, which is where we're going to be today. <clears throat> It's Malachi chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 10. So if you'd open your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, get your smartphone, your iPad, or one of those lesser devices um, and, and open those. And uh, we will pray for you if you have one of those lesser devices. Um, because, you know, well, I have the Microsoft one. Well, you know, Microsoft works as an oxymoron. Um, just like jumbo shrimp and uh, military intelligence. Um, anyway... Um, so Malachi chapter 2, and uh, we're going to start in verse 10. Here's what it says. It says, uh, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? And why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has, has, has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob a man who does this, being awake and aware, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. If you pause there and give me your attention. We're going to talk about three things that consist of a uh, godly marriage, according to these verses that we're going to read through this, this last section in chapter 2 of Malachi. But here's the first one if you're a note taker. Uh, the first one is this, is that a godly marriage is, number one, between believers. It's between believers. That's why he goes into this whole thing saying that they, he's run off, that uh, Judah has run off the nation and has gone and married the daughter of a foreign god. They were go, leaving someone that wasn't of the same faith and going to someone else. Now listen, being different is okay in marriage, but not in this issue. My wife and I are as different as can be. My, my, uh, our backgrounds are totally different. I'm Cuban, which means my family is totally crazy. Um, and my, my wife's family is uh, Eastern European, so they're, you know, uh, like kind of snooty like Eastern Europeans are. Um, and, uh, and, but I say that in love because, you know, some of us have in-laws, some of us have outlaws. But, um, you know, feel free to use that later. And... Uh, but, you know, when that, may, that may not seem like a big deal, but when we first got married, I mean, it was a huge deal because these two worlds came crashing together. You see, when, when my family wants to see me, they just knock on the door any time. They feel that freedom, you know. Oh, yeah! You know, and they just start going crazy. And, uh, and I'm like, dude, it's way too early for this. And uh, I wanted to see you. I was in the neighborhood. Oh, really? Where were you? Melbourne. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and so... Um, they would just show up, and that was like a huge deal for my wife. Like, how can these people show up unannounced? I can't, I can't believe that. And then, um, you know, her family, when they wanted to come over, I mean, they would make an appointment like three weeks in advance. I mean, sent by courier. We would like to cordially invite you to this, you know. And then, you know, so her wife would come over, and then they'd come over for dinner, and then she would write them a thank you note for coming over. And I'm like, what is this? They just ate a steak at my house. They should be sending me a note saying thank you. And, uh, and, you know, and these kinds of differences can be overcome. But when a believer marries a non-believer, that's a recipe for big problems. Let me read you um, one of the most important passages on this subject. I put it in your notes in 2 Corinthians 6. It says this, Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. You see, when it comes to issues of faith, we need to be united and agreed. 
The people of Israel, the men of Israel, were marrying foreign women who worshipped other gods. God had told them not to do that. That's what we see in Malachi, is they didn't think it was a big deal to leave the, the women of their faith and go after women who did not share their faith as believers marrying unbelievers. And here's what God was telling them. He's saying, listen, if you do this, it will not only be the undoing of your family, it will ultimately be the undoing of the nation. And they were, and he was right. Let me read you a passage. Um, I, I put it in your notes. This is in 1 Kings, uh, but it's so important. Let, let me read it to you, and then I'll comment on it. It says this. It says, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, uh, Sidon and from among the Hittites. And the Lord clearly instructed the people of Israel, you shall not marry them because they will turn your hearts to other gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. Um, besides the fact that he's got no, a little over 900 wives too many, okay? We're going we're gonna to punt that for another time. Uh, but this is the thing that happens. He, he gets involved in these relationships, and the inevitable happens. Inevitably, they lead his heart away from the Lord. And this is, this is the thing that was happening. And, and I want you to notice something. The, in Israel, everything is humming along well. They go into the land. Everything's going well. They, they have a king named Saul. Saul's not so great, but they get a king named David. David has a son named Solomon. And Solomon, it, the, the Israel reaches the zenith of their influence, power, uh, of their wealth, everything. Of their, everything is, is at, the, at its height during the time of Solomon until he starts loving these other women. And they eventually pull his heart away from the Lord and to these other gods. That, while it starts at the top, eventually he goes... From, he goes from there, and then it starts infecting its way into the people. And they say, well, you know, Solomon loves these other women. I guess we can do that too. And, that's, and it's at that moment that becomes now the erosion. And where did it start? It started in the marriage relationship because the family is the very foundation of any nation. It's the foundation of civilization is, is, is two people and their God committing together in, in, in holy matrimony. And so what happens is, is that now the erosion begins. It starts in Solomon's family. It starts now in other families. And soon after, the entire nation is going after other gods. And the same way it happens with them is the same way it can happen with us. Is that God says that Christians should marry other Christians. Why? Because light and darkness don't have fellowship together in the passage that we read. And when he says that Christians should marry other Christians, he's talking about real Christians. So when you, talk, when, you know, when, when you talk to a girl and she says, well, so you're, date, you're, you know, you're, you're thinking about dating this guy, you're thinking about marrying this guy, is he a Christian? And she's like, well, I don't, I'm not sure. You're not sure? Well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> being a little bit Christian is like being a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't, but you're not like in some, like, you know, middle zone. Um, and so what ends, what ends up happening is, is that we say, well, um, but is he a Christian? Well, I'm not sure. I, I mean, he... He was fixing something. He's so good at fixing things. And so he was fixing something, and then he hit his finger with a hammer, and he called on Jesus. And um, that, that's got to count for something. No, that doesn't count. And uh, does this guy love God? Listen, and here's why this is so important. Let me tell you why it's so important for you. It's because your faith is the core of who you are. It's the very center of who you are. If someone doesn't understand that, they don't understand you. And so the last thing that you want is someone who, listen, puts up with the fact that you're a Christian. You don't want that. You want someone who doesn't just doesn't put up with the fact that you're a Christian. They celebrate it. You want someone who shares your faith and you're walking in the same direction. You want to marry someone? Let me, give you, let me encourage you to look for two things. The first is this, what I like to call spiritual compatibility. That is, that you're both walking with Jesus. And if you aren't sure if the other person is walking with Jesus or the other person is new or weak in their faith, listen, you got to slow down because you're going to get hurt and that other person is going to get hurt too. And if you don't believe me, listen, I can introduce you to hundreds of people who have made that decision and, and uh, it has not gone well. The second one is what I like to call directional compatibility. That is, you're both moving in the same direction. You both have the same values, the same priorities, the same dreams, the same goals. Um, 
The Bible says it this way, can two people walk hand in hand if they aren't going to the same place? The answer is, is obviously not. But see, what can happen is, is that even as Christians, you can have different priorities. So if, you're, if you want to get married and you say, well, I want to marry this person, and say, well, what do you want to do with your life? Well, I want to go serve the Lord on the mission field. Well, what's this guy that you're, you know, this guy or girl that you're thinking about marrying? Oh, they, they would hate to do that. They never want to do that. Well, what's going to happen? Is like one of you going to go? No, you're, you're either both going to go or neither of you are going to go. But you've got to make sure that you have the same heart when it comes to your dreams, your ambitions, your priorities, and your values. And let, singles, this means we've got to choose well. The, the classic thing that singles do is that we downplay the issues before we get married and then wake up to a very rude awakening. If he isn't interested in God, marrying him isn't going to help. Well, see, I think that if I date him and he sees my life, that then he'll want to know the Lord and see that dating will actually bring him to the Lord. Yeah, we call that missionary dating, and that's not in the Bible. Uh, you know, maybe it's in like the Mad Libs Bible, like where you fill in parts, but it's not in like the real Bible. So listen, the time to choose wisely is now. The time to choose wisely is now. So that's the first thing that was happening, is that marriage has got to be between believers, and this is the way that the people of Israel were going astray in Malachi's day. The second thing is this. Look at verse 13. <coughs> it says this. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with good will from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? For the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did, but he, did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. If you pause there and give me your attention, here's, uh, here's the second thing I want you to note about a godly marriage. And that is that a godly marriage produces godly children. He says, what, is, what does God seek there? He says, why did God make you one? Because he seeks godly offspring. Um, can I, how many of you are parents? Can I ask that? Look at that. Look at that. These are the people to pray for, everyone. Um, uh, <laughs> Carrie and I became parents in 2007, and uh, we had no, when my oldest daughter Mia was born, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, you know, when they wheeled us, um, when they were wheeling Carrie into the, the room where she was going to give birth, um, you know, dads, you know, those of you that were there, you know, that they have you put on like the astronaut suit. And uh, so, you know, you put on the big astronaut suit, which, by the way, is made of paper. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm glad this is, uh, you know, so it's like someone just splashes water and this whole thing is going to dissolve. But anyway, uh, but anyway, so you put on the astronaut suit and the hat and then the thing. And so we had some friends there and they said, Bob, you're about to be a dad. How do you feel? And, uh, and I just took the mask off and I said, honestly, I feel like vomiting right now. Uh, I was so nervous. I was, and I don't know, some people, they're really excited about becoming a parent. I was so nervous. See, when I was a kid, I used to lose my Star Wars figures all the time. And I'm thinking, these kids, they come home, they're not that much bigger than action figures when they come out. And I'm thinking, like, I am going to be, I'm, like, personally responsible for another human. And, uh, and I was so, I was so worried about this. And so then, uh, we were, you know, you're in the hospital for a couple days, which is fine, because I felt like there were nurses there, and they seemed professional. Uh, and, and, you know, like, well, what do I do now? And they're like, well, you know, like, change your diaper. How do you do that? You know, so then they kind of worked with us, or worked with me mostly. And, um, and then what, what ends up happening is that um, when we got home, uh, you know, when they're, when they're kids, they have the bracelet with the low jack. Um, the, the kids have that in the hospital. Then they take the low jack off, but then they still have that, like, uh, you know, that, that house arrest bracelet. Um, so when we get home, we're like, hey, we got to take this off. And so we're like, all right, let's get a pair of scissors. We get a pair of scissors. I mean, we had been home literally less than five minutes. And we're like, all right, so now let's, let's, let's cut the, the bracelet. And we're like, okay. And so she's like, well, how do you want to do this? So I say, all right, I'll hold Mia, and then you cut the, the bracelet. I, so I'm holding Mia, and she's cutting the bracelet. So we're like, I'm like no, not like that. You've got to turn it because you're going you're gonna to cut her if you do it. So then we're trying to do this and cut the bracelet, and we're being oh so careful to not cut her as we cut the bracelet that we, we get it, we cut her without cutting the bracelet, but we get, we clip her other foot with the back of the handle as we're coming down. So then Mia starts to cry, and then Carrie starts to cry because really this is her fault. And then, 
I start to cry, and I'm like, we're not responsible enough for parenting. And, uh, and, and you know, so we're freaking out, and we've only been home for five minutes. And, and I'm telling you, and this is, you know, Mia turns six on Wednesday, and she's survived. And, uh, and Xander, it will be four in a few months, and Olivia just turned one. And I'll tell you that being a dad has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And people ask us, you know, because my wife and I, my daughter was born about a week before our 10th anniversary. And so people say, you know, did, did, uh, did, you, guys, did you guys plan that because you guys were going to start the church and you wanted to wait to have kids? And I'm like, no. My goal has been to get my wife pregnant since the day we got married. Uh, and I've been very vocal about that. Uh, and so, but listen, I tell you all this to say that one of the reasons that God puts godly men and godly women together is for the purpose of procreation. And he doesn't, he doesn't say this, why did God make you one? So that you would have offspring. He says so that you would have godly offspring. God, God wants Christians to raise babies who become Christians. Listen, the mandate that God gives, look at what he says. It's in your notes in Genesis chapter 1. He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The first mandate that man and woman are given as they are together is that they are to be fruitful and multiply. But see, what God's desire is that godly people have kids, but not just have kids and let them go crazy. There's lots of people that grew up in Christian homes and their parents did not teach them how to walk with God. Our mandate is to train our kids to love the Lord and to walk with the Lord. That's why the Bible would say, and you fathers don't provoke your children to wrath, but train them up, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke your kids. You know what is probably the biggest uh, issue with provoking our kids? Is that this is how we provoke them. We, we frustrate them when we're inconsistent. You know what studies have shown? And this is not like Christian. These are, you know, from universities and whatever. This is, what the, this is what's said over and over again. Is that um, kids behave better and feel safer when there is structure and consistency. Now, kids say they don't want the rules, they hate the rules and all this, but here's what the reality is. Kids behave best when there is structure and consistency. Kids behave best when they know what's coming next. When you tell them, hey, here's the deal. We're going to get to church, and then we're going to take you to class. And then after class, we're going to pick you up, and then we're going to go have lunch. Okay. Well, but I don't want to. Well, that's good for you, but that's what we're doing. And, uh, and, and, so, and that's just the, the reality. Now, here's the thing, and this is what happens, is that sometimes what we'll do is we'll say, well, you know, I don't want to just, and, and this is the thing parents say this, and they think they're being kind, but actually they're, they're, they're training their kids for disaster. And so say, well, I don't want to push God on my kids. I don't want to push God on my kids. I want to let them decide for themselves. As if, you know, like a four-year-old has like a PhD in philosophy and can really decide for themselves. Um, and so now let me tell you, let, let me just read you this verse. This is an important verse. In Proverbs uh, 22, I put it in, it says this. In Proverbs 22, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Let me give you some bad news. Children are born unwise. I'm sorry to tell you that. Your kids are unwise. My kids are unwise. That's a sad reality. Um, because, and here's the reason why. Because by nature, kids are selfish. They think the world revolves around them. And part, like 50% of parenting is trying to, you know, extricate them from that idea. The world does not revolve around you. Everyone is not thinking about you all the time. Um, and so, you know, God calls parents to discipline kids. And that's part of how children learn to be wise. But I want you to understand something, that that word discipline, that word discipline, that word discipline is the Hebrew word musar, M-U-S-A-R. Which means this. This is what the word discipline means. It means to teach or to coach. It means to teach or to coach. Sometimes we hear about the rod of correction, and we think that that means like beating kids with a stick. That's not what that means. Listen, a shepherd would have a staff. And here's what he would do. He would beat wolves, and he would use the staff to bring, his, to bring the sheep in, to bring them closer to him. 
And that's where we, you know, I think sometimes, we, you know, the, these, sometimes these verses get taken totally out of context and we miss um, the culture in which they were written. This is about drawing kids closer. Discipline is about teaching kids between right and wrong and helping them see that there is a better way to live. Now, once again, is there a place for corporal punishment or spanking? I mean, I think so, and, and you decide that. Um, but that's not the only way to discipline. The Bible says you train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he won't depart from that. Built into that idea carries the idea that you train up a child in the way that they best receive the training. My son, Xander, who's three and a half, um, I don't remember ever spanking him. You know why? I don't have to. When my, when my son does something wrong, I look at him a certain way, and repentance, like, just oozes. You know, like, you, something happens, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know. And I'm like, all right, buddy, come on. Let, you know, that's not the right thing to do. And, you know, and, and it's just, now, I will admit, he, he's not like that with his mom, but he is like that with me. And, um, but the, the idea is, is that the training should match the child. And listen, let me tell you one of my... Um, one of my, what I think is one of the most important verses about parenting, and I think it's a forgotten idea of parenting. Let me read you this. This is Proverbs 23. It says, The father of a righteous man has great joy, and he who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad, and may she who gave birth to you rejoice. Can I, can I tell you something? You know what your kids need to know? Is that you delight in them. Is that you're proud of them and that, and that you love them. Um, my daughter's birthday is on Wednesday, but we, we did a big party for her. Uh, we went to the Young at Art Children's Museum, and we had this big party and whatever. And, um, and uh, just, I mean, so many of her friends came out. Um, and so we're at this party, and they're building stuff and playing and all this. And this, this is a huge museum. And here's what happens. Is that, uh, about halfway through, my daughter comes over, and she just hugs me and kisses me and says, Thank you for the party. And, uh, and, and, here's, and here's what I said. I, I just, you know, I knelt down, and I said, Mia, I want you to know that it, it is my delight to do this for you. I love you so much. I am so proud of you. And it, really, it is my delight to do this for you. Let me, can I just tell you that that is not the reality for a lot of parents. That's not the reality I grew up in. You know, when my parents first took me to Disney World, you know what they did? Complained the entire time they took me. All they did, you know, and, and mind you, this is like, it's not like they took me to all four parks when I went, because I went like 8,000 years ago when I was a kid. There was one park, and it was like half the size that it is now. And they're like, 50 cents for a Coke? Are you serious? We're not buying any of that for you. You made us come here. And I'm like, dude, I didn't drive the car. And they're like, no, you made us come. And, and it's like complaining the whole time. And I remember I spent the whole time with a backpack with a two-liter bottle of Coke because my parents were too cheap to spend 45 cents on a Coke that was there. They packed jamón con queso sandwiches in the back, right? And so, and then they're like, now you sit on that bench and you eat your sandwich and have a good time! <laughs> All right. This is the Tower of Terror, you know? Uh, you know, uh, and listen, it's, 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 you know, and once again, this is what happens when you're raised by complete maniacs. Um, but I'm telling you that, that there's just like, Here's what kids, eat, and here's what happens is that, you know, you're, you're letting out your frustration at the Disney Corporation on, of course, a person who can really impact change at Disney, which is a six-year-old kid. Um, and, and then, here's, and here's what you're doing, but, and, and now you just ruin the experience for the kid, when it could be like an amazing family moment. And, and then, but here's what will happen other times. So it's like, well, maybe, no, no, I don't do that. But, you know, I'm just not the, I'm not the verbal type. I say I love you to my kids by putting a roof over their head and feeding them. You can file that under being the lame-o of the year. Um, you know, that, that's, seriously, that is like, I, guys say that, and it's like, dude, you got to do better than that. Um, and, and, like, you know, kids, like, they need to hear that, that, that you love them. They need to hear that all the time. They need to hear that they're doing a great job. They need to hear that you're proud of them. You know what? Listen, there is, and this is all like, um, Oh, man, I have no time to talk about this. Um, anyway, just trust me on that. And, uh, but I'll tell you this. No, because there's all these, like, if, if, you know, you get into, like, neural pathways, how neural pathways are formed, and it has to do this, that it's all a matter of repetition. Um, and, and so, but there's no time for that. And then I got to, like, pull out an illustration of the human brain and whatever. There's no time. But here's the thing. You know, I, I, but I will, I will tell you this. I tell my son Xander, 
who's three and a half, I tell him that he's a good boy multiple times a day. And you know what Xander believes about himself? He believes that he's a good boy. I tell my daughter Mia that she's beautiful. And you know what Mia believes about herself? That she's beautiful and that she's worthy of respect. And I tell, you know, and, and uh, I tell Xander the other day, um, Xander, you're a good boy. And he's like, yes, I'm a good boy. Xander, you're my big boy. And then he says, yes, and you're my big boy. And uh, so <laughs> it's like, whoa, let's relax here. Uh, and then, you know, like, but I told Mia, this is just, I think it was on Friday. I picked her up from school and I'm like, Mia, you're beautiful. And she says, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, okay. Mia, next lesson is on humility. Um, but we're going we're gonna to work on that. And, uh, but listen, here's the point. God's desire is not that we just have kids, but that we have godly kids, that we teach them how to, how to love God, how to walk with God, how to, how to love people, um, how to love their neighbor as themselves, how, how to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is, what we're, this is our call as parents. But there's one more thing I want to show you in these passages that God says about marriage. Here's what he says. Look at verse 16. He says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. For you've wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, In what way have we wearied him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the third thing I want to share with you as we close, and that is that a godly marriage is for life. It's for life. Um, you know, it's, it's a crazy thing that men and women are so different. And the interesting thing is, is that men and women, um, you know, you start, if you're married, you, one of the things that you loved about your spouse was that they are different than you. It's so interesting. They like so many different things than what I like. And, and, and you know, that's what happens, that, that opposites attract. The problem is you get married and then opposites attack. And that, that's how, how it changes. And, um, and then, the very listen, the very thing that you were different, what, that drew you together, is the very thing that you believe is now pulling you apart. And, that's, and then we'll say, well, we've just got irreconcilable differences, and then we bail on the relationship. Listen, 80% of people who end their marriages cite irreconcilable differences as the reason. Let me just um, tell you the reality right now, that you are going to have irreconcilable differences with your spouse no matter what. I have irreconcilable differences with my wife of 16 years, and, and it's not going to change. I, we had irreconcilable differences from the day we got home from our, our, our wedding. And we, we got on the honeymoon. You know what happened? is that uh, the next morning we're brushing our teeth and, and my wife is of the belief that you can actually, I can't even believe this, but she's of the belief that you can actually squeeze the tube from the middle to get, to get the toothpaste. And I'm like, that's not in the Bible. And, I, you know, and it's like, you got to go from the end and work your way out. Because the Bible says do all things decently and in order. You got to start from the end and work your way through. You can't, you can't, you know, like choke the thing like you're killing a guy that owes you money, you know. It's like the loan shark way to, uh, to brush your teeth. You can't do that. You got to start from the back and work your way through. And this was like a thing. Why are you going to make a thing about something that's not a thing? I'm not making a thing. I'm just saying this is the wrong way to do it. I'm trying to teach you something here. It's like, oh, I'm not trying to Mr. Teacher, not, you know. And then it becomes a thing. And then it becomes a thing, which shouldn't be a thing, because you're just brushing our teeth, now it becomes a thing. So it's like, well, what do you do? You can't fix that. Now we use the pump toothpaste. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Problem solved. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. There are things you're not going to agree with. You're not going to get on board with that no matter what. And the thing is, is that there's this reality in our culture that says, well, marriage is hard, but, um, you know, if I, if I end the marriage, that's going to make it easy. Listen, marriage is hard. Whoever said marriage is easy, let me tell you a little secret. They're not married, okay? Uh, but whoever, listen, marriage is hard. Divorce, my friends, is harder. Listen, God's design, God's hope is for one man and one woman to love each other, to commit themselves to each other, to make a covenant with each other and with their God, and to spend the rest of their lives together. That's why God plainly says, I hate divorce. Now, let me tell you something that I think is very important. And this might not be the case, that, that you, maybe you don't believe this, but there have been some that have believed this, and I, and I want to clear up this misunderstanding. And part of the misunderstanding is, is this, and this was actually um, in the past, not so much in, in the last 
hundred years or so, but in the past, this is what the church has taught, and this is a grave mistake, is that if God hates divorce, then implied is that he hates divorced people. My friends, that's not true. Let me tell you the reality is that God loves you, period. There is no asterisk, there is no footnote, there is no semicolon, there is no comma to that. God loves you, period. And just because you had a a relationship that didn't work for whatever reason, your fault, not your fault, partially your fault, whatever, God is going to continue to love you. But see, the reason that God hates, so God does not hate divorced people. God hates divorce because it pulls apart what God has put together. And that's why this, Jesus would say in in Matthew chapter 19, and you'll see it up on the screen, he says, therefore, what God has joined together let not man pull apart. And see, one of the things that happens, say, well, well, then why do couples pull apart? One of the reasons why we pull apart is because um, there's something that happens in our hearts long before we decide that we have irreconcilable differences and it's not going to work out. You see, that's why Solomon in the Proverbs would write, he would write, for guard your hearts, for it affects everything you do. You got you to guard your heart above all else. And the idea is, is that someone bought into a lie, and in their heart they believed that life would be easier if I weren't married to that person anymore. But here are the stats. Most of us know the stats. One out of two marriages don't make it. What many people, the, the stats that many people don't know is the stat that says that 60% of remarriages end in divorce. 75% of third marriages end in divorce. So, I mean, what, what exactly is happening here? It's not, well, I just can't find the right person. Well, maybe, but maybe the, the greater reality is, is that there's something that happened in the heart that just said, well, this one didn't work, and this one didn't work, and this one didn't work, and maybe we need to reevaluate what's happening in our heart. Because Jesus would say it this way. He would say, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, I mean, are you, where, where, what are you doing with your heart? The treasure that's in your heart, the things that are, that are most important to you, what are you doing? How are you investing in your marriage relationship? Listen, there are, there are guys, and guys, let, let me just tell you that, um, what can happen to us? What can happen to us is that we actually start to believe uh, that, you know, we, we, we put our, our career or our hobby just on the altar of at what we fixate on and what we invest in. And, uh, you know, the Bible says you can't serve two masters. And so you put all of your time and your treasure and your effort and your energy and your money and everything, um, and that's what you give your heart to. Uh, sometimes it's, well, you know, I'm married, but, uh, you know, you flirt with a girl at the office, and, hey, you know, we're just flirting. But then at some point in time, your wife can't do anything right at home. And why is that? It's because you're giving your heart to somebody else. And the Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will ultimately go. Now, ladies, let me, let me and especially if you're a mom, let me talk to you in, in what, what I see happen that's oh so common. What can happen is, in, in the lives of, of, of moms, is that you just give everything to your kids. Because you see, this is this is a very good thing. It's a it's a it's a godly thing. You want to raise your kids, but what'll happen is is that you put the relationship with your kids above your relationship with your spouse, and then he's off being a career chaser, and you're off investing everything in, in the kids. And here's what takes place. What takes place is is now you look at each other and you're like, who are you? Because there's no there's no there's nothing that's being invested with your husband with your wife. But see in what would happen? What would happen if we did something a little different? What would happen instead of just focusing on the start and how we're going to begin our relationship? What if we focused on not just how we're going to start, but how are we going to make sure and invest in such a way into each other so we make sure that we not just start well, but that we finish well? I mean, what would that look like? What if you, it was a decision, especially those of us that have kids, where you just said, you know what, twice a month, here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave the kids with a sitter, with, with mom, with a family member, and we're going to go out. We're going to go out, we're going to spend time together, and we're going to connect and romance each other like, like we used to. The things that you guy, you know, husband, the things that you got to get her are the things that you do to keep her. And maybe there's this moment, you know, once a year where the two of you get away, and you just turn the rest of the world off, and you grow deeper in love, and you open your hearts to each other. You know, I told you that my wife and I are celebrating our, um, our 16th anniversary here um, next week. And we're going away. It's only one night, but we're going away. And uh, we're going to celebrate our anniversary. And I spent more money on that hotel room for that one night than I spent on my first car. All right? 
And, uh, and I'm not even joking about that. It's actually, uh, it's, and you might say, and here's what can happen. Oh man, I can't afford that. I disagree. I would say you can't afford not to if you want to finish well. Because the reality, and, and let me say this, and I think this is important. The reality is we can do all of those things and they'll help. But the first order of business is to make sure things are right between you and God. Because we can be doing all the right things mechanically. You know, well, we're going to go out on this day, we're going to do this. But, I mean, you've got, you got to um, invest your heart into what, what it is that you're doing. And that, and that begins by really understanding that there's a covenant between a man and woman and their God. And you're God. Because the Bible gives us this picture. It's amazing to me that when the Bible wants to describe what it's like to be in relationship with God, it uses marriage as the metaphor. And this is just like a man and a woman. There's a mystery between the two. There's a mystery between Christ and the church. And see, I want you to understand the stats on marriage, you know, 50% don't make it. But let me give you another stat. When there's two people married who are both believers, who are both praying together regularly, reading the Bible together,